Hello, welcome back to Teen Story Share. It's a new year and we're starting a brand new book. This is The Birch Bark House by award-winning author Louise Erdrich. It's about a young girl named Omakius and her family. They are Ojibwe and it takes place during the mid 1800s. And if you're not familiar with this, a lot of people actually recommend reading it alongside uh, or as a companion with the Little House series because they take place during the same time period and you get a more well-rounded view of the time period, both from Native American Ojibwe perspective and from settler perspective. So if you wanna know more about that, you can check out the description down below, but I'm just gonna start reading right now. The girl from Spirit Island. The only person left alive on the island was a baby girl. The tired men who had come there to pick up furs from the Anishinaabe people stood uneasily on the rocky shore. The voyagers watched from a distance as the baby crawled in a circle, whimpering and pitiful. Her tiny dress of good blue wool was embroidered with white beads and ribbons, and her new moccasins were carefully sewn. It was clear she had been loved. It was also clear that the family who had loved her was gone. All of the fires in the village were cold. The dead lay sadly in blankets, curled as though sleeping. Smallpox had killed them all. The voyagers trembled at the thought that the disease might already have chosen one of them. Surely, they muttered, the baby had the sickness too. She's sick. She looks tired, said one man when she lay down against one of the blanketed figures. Let her sleep. Birds were singing, dozens of tiny white-throated sparrows. The trilling, rippling sweetness of their songs contrasted strangely with the silent horror below. First one, then the other of the men turned away. They got back into their canoes. As they paddled toward the next island, all were silent, thoughtful. Some wore hard expressions. One man had tears in his eyes. His name was Hat. He thought of his wife and decided he would tell her about the baby. If there was anyone in the world who'd go and rescue that little girl, it was his wife. He shivered a little as he thought of her. He couldn't help it. Tallow, she was called. And sometimes she scared him with her temper. Other times, he was amazed at her courage. He grimaced in shame. Unlike him, his wife was afraid of nothing. Knee bin, Summer. Chapter One, The Birch Bark House. She was named Omakias, or Little Frog, because her first step was a hop. She grew into a nimble young girl of seven winters, a thoughtful girl with shining brown eyes and a wide grin, only missing her two top front teeth. She touched her upper lip. She still wasn't used to those teeth gone and was impatient for new, grown-up teeth to complete her smile. Just like her namesake, Omakias now stared long at a silky patch of bog before she gathered herself and jumped. One hummock, safety. Omakias sprang wide again. This time she landed on the very tip top of a pointed old stump. She balanced there, looking all around. The lagoon water moved in sparkling crescents. Thick swales of swamp grass rippled. Mud turtles napped in the sun. The world was so calm that Omakias could hear herself blink. Only the sweet call of a solitary white-throated sparrow pierced the cool of the woods beyond. All of a sudden, Grandma yelled, I found it! Startled, Omakias slipped and spun her arms in wheels. She teetered, but somehow kept her balance. Two big skipping hops, another leap, and she was on dry land. She stepped over spongy leaves and moss into the woods where the sparrows sang nesting songs in delicate relays. Where are you? Nokomis yelled again. I found the tree. I'm coming, Omakias called back to her grandmother. It was spring, time to cut the birch bark. All winter long, Omakias's family lived in a cabin of sweet scented cedar at the edge of the village of La Pointe on an island in Lake Superior that her people called Monengwanekaning, Island of the Golden-Breasted Woodpecker. As soon as the earth warmed, the birch bark house always took shape under Nokomis's swift hands. Now, the dappled light of tiny new leaves moved on Grandma's beautiful, softly lined face. In one hand, she waved her sharp knife, taken from the beaded pouch on her hip. 
In the other, she held tobacco. Noocomus was getting ready to make an offering to the spirits, or manitous. They loved tobacco. Omakias banged the tree her grandmother had found. Yes, here, here it is, this one. Omakias was skinny, wiry, and tough for seven winters. She slammed the trunk of the birch with a big rotten stick. Splinters of soft wood flew. Booney, Nokomis scolded. Leave it alone. She walked up to the tree and put her leathery, paw-like hands on the smooth bark, feeling for flaws. Yes, she decided, her eyes sparkling at her granddaughter. A good one. Is it ready? Geg it, said Nokomis. Surely. Nokomis's tobacco pouch was decorated with blue and white beads in the shape of a pipe. She had owned this tobacco bag ever since Omakias could remember. When she talked to the Manitous, Nokomis dipped out a pinch of tobacco. Old sister, she said to the birch bark tree, we need your skin for our shelter. At the base of the tree, Nokomis left her offering, sweet and fragrant. Then she peered closely, deciding just where to make the first cut. Suddenly, she pressed her razor-sharp knife into the bark. Omakias stepped back. Light filtered golden and green onto their faces. Tiny white flowers poked out of dead leaves. There were still traces of grainy old snowbanks in the shadiest spots, but in places the sun was actually hot. Pow! As soon as Grandma made the proper cuts, the birch bark, filled with spring water, nearly burst from the tree. Omakias helped her grandmother carefully push the bark aside. Then the two peeled it away strip by strip. She and Omakias carried the light, papery, pink-brown rolls out of the woods, down a trail to a special place near the water. Here, they set up the birch bark house. Damp ground made Nokomis's old bones ache, so she spread out her brown cattail mat and sat down there to sew those pieces of bark together. Omakias helped her, threading the tough basswood strands through holes punched by Grandma's awl. Meanwhile, Mama and Omakias's older sister tied together a bent frame of willow poles. Finally, as the light faded, they fastened the mats of bark onto the willow frame, a half skeleton of pliable saplings. The bark mats overlapped like shingles to shed the rain. Each one was secured to the next, so as not to blow off in a storm. When the house was swept out, smoothed, fussily arranged, and admired, they moved in. The children, Omakias's brother, Little Pinch, Baby Niwo, Omakias's older sister, Pretty Angeline, and Omakias herself spread their blankets around the stone fire pit. Mama and Nokomis hung the smoky woven bags of rice and tools and medicines from the willow poles above. Omakias' family were Anishinaabeg, and this was their island. Her father, her day day, was in the fur trade business, which meant that he was often gone, paddling the great canoes for the fur company, or sometimes trapping animals himself. Yellow Kettle, her mother, was quick-tempered but always laughing, and her eyes shrewdly took in the world. Yellow Kettle was a strong-looking woman and beautiful. Her smile was generous, enigmatic, slightly crooked and kind. She missed nothing when it came to her children. It was impossible to hide a half-done job, ridiculous even to think of sneaking away in the morning before gathering wood for the fire and water for her cooking pot. And if Mama didn't notice the younger children's whereabouts, Omakias' older sister, Angeline, surely would. Angeline was smart and so pretty, people turned in their tracks to stare at her. Her hair was thick, her hands clever. The beads in her designs were laid down in strict rows. Her stitches never faltered. Her steps when she walked or danced were clear and graceful. She was so perfect that Omakias despaired. Still, she hoped that she herself would turn out like Angeline and was sometimes embarrassed to find herself following at Angeline's heels like a puppy. Most of the time, Angeline was kind to Amakias and let her tag along and admire from a distance. But there were also times her words were sharp as bee stings, and at those times Omakias shed tears her sister never knew or probably even cared about. For, as very beautiful people sometimes are, Angeline could be just a little cold-hearted at times. Omakias' little brother, Pinch, was the only really big problem in her life. The sad truth was, and she couldn't tell this to a single person, 
Omachius didn't like Little Pinch. She thought there was something wrong with him, so greedy, so loud. But although his ways were mischievous and bold, Pinch loved his mother deeply and he clung to her side. In fact, he took up all her attention, even more than the baby. He clutched Mama's skirts with fat, tough little fingers. He yelled at Omachius if she was slow in giving up her willow doll, her little rock people, or anything else for that matter, including food, special pieces of driftwood she found, even her favorite sleeping place near Grandma. He thought he deserved everything. At least when it came to Niwo, there was nothing to complain about. He was so sweet that Omachius often pretended he was her very own baby. Of course, she hardly ever got to hold him, for he was still very young. Still, she was sure he preferred her to Angeline and certainly to Pinch. Sometimes he even held his arms out to her when Mama was holding him and yelled with delight when Omachius picked him up. As it grew dark, the family ate McCooks of moose stew and fresh greens and berries, licked their fingers and bowls clean, and at last rolled themselves into warm, fluffy rabbit skin blankets that still smelled of the cedary smoke of their winter cabin. They were glad to be close to fire, sleeping on soft, grassy earth under leafy sky, and best of all, near water. They fell asleep to the peaceful, curious, continual lapping sound of waves. The fresh wind across the big lake blew away the smoke of cooking fires and vanquished the mosquitoes that came out in whining droves and had plagued them in town. It was good to sleep where the village dogs didn't bark all night and where the only sound to disturb their dreams was the pine trees sifting wind in a lulling roar. Unless, of course, it stormed. The moon went down to a fingernail sliver and the corn popped from the ground. The leaves of birch grew big enough to flutter in the wind. And then, one night, the first storm of the summer struck the island and startled everybody from their dreams. The fire was down to red winking eyes when Omachius woke with an uneasy feeling. Something approached. She'd felt a footstep. Omachius was always the one to sleep near Grandma, and now she rolled close. There was a lonely insistence to the sound of the wind, and then everything went still. Far off, she heard one huge footstep. There was a long silence. Then another step fell. The earth shook slightly beneath her, vibrated as though she lay on the head of a vast drum. A drum? She remembered that Grandma had said the island was the drum of the thunder beings. Closer and closer they came, shaking earth with their footsteps. Omachius's lonely feeling became fright. She hid her face and tried not to think of balls of witch fire or the hooting of Grandfather Owl. She tried to keep herself from picturing pakooks, the skeletons of little children, flying through the woods, or the icy breath of giant windigos striding over the ground, cracking trees off with every foot crunch. Another step, another and another fell, and then the wind howled to life. Rain slashed against the tightly sewn walls. A breath of air stirred up the slumbering coals and cast shadows leaping and fighting on the inside walls of the little birch bark house. The willow poles trembled, bouncing with the force of the gusts of wind. The birch bark scraped and flapped but was held on with tight stitches. Omachias hid her face as thunder rolled, smacking onto the lake shore, waking everything and everyone with its quick violence. The storm punished the ground and then passed over, dying off in softer mumbles. The dull thuds of thunder falling in the distance now felt comforting, and before the sounds entirely faded, Omachius was asleep. Moning Wanekening, the island of the golden-breasted woodpecker, sparkled innocently after that night of raw thunder and lightning. Omachius woke and immediately began wondering, what had the storm done to the trees? What had the waves washed onto the beach? What interesting bits of wood that she could use for pretend dolls? What kind of day would it be? Were the little berries on the edge of the path ripe yet? An unpleasant piece of wondering came to her too. Had her mother finished scraping and tanning that ugly moose hide or would she have to help her? Oh, she hoped not. How she hoped. There was a saying she hated. Grandma said it all too often. Each animal, she would say, has just enough brains to tan its own hide. 
Mama tanned the moose hide with the very brains of the moose, and Omachius hated the oozy feeling of them on her hands, not to mention the boring, endless scraping and rubbing that went into making a hide soft enough for moccasins. From a fire in the center of the bark house, a thin curl of smoke rose, then vanished through a crescent of sunlight in the roof. If only she could escape with the smoke. She could already hear Mama and Grandma outside at the cooking fires. They were planning the day's work. In no time at all, that soaking moose hide would be stretched on a branch frame, and she would be required to scrape at it with the sharpened deer's shoulder bone that her mother kept in a bundle of useful things near the door. Her arms would tire. They would feel like falling off. Her fingers would go numb. Her back would hurt. The awful smell would get into her skin. And meanwhile, all the little birds would find the luscious patch of berries she alone knew about. By the time she got that stupid old moose hide softened up, they would have eaten every last berry. She must act quickly. The air was fresh, delicious, smelling of new leaves in the woods, just popped out mushrooms, the pelts of young deer. The air flowed in, rain washed, under the strips of birch bark walls she had helped sew together yesterday. Like a small striped snake, like a salamander, or a squirrel maybe, or a raccoon, something quick, little, harmless, and desperate, she slid, crept, wiggled underneath the sides of the summer house. The seam of bark caught her in the small of the back, stuck tight. If only she hadn't done such a good job of sewing it up. If only, too, Angeline didn't have such quick ears and sure knowledge of her whereabouts at all times. There was a firm pressure suddenly at the small of her back, still caught on the inside, her sister's foot, her sister's gloating voice. Neshime, baby sister, little frog, don't go jumping off. Then there was her mother, rounding the back of the house, one side of her hair is still flowing down, unbraided. She glanced in surprise at Omachius, trapped, then unable to hide her amusement, a big grin spread over Mama's face. Her admired big sister, her beloved mother, laughing. There was Omachius, laughter from the front and laughter from behind, and suddenly all of last night's thunder in her heart. Omachius sat near the cooking fire and slowly, with deep inner fury, ate a bowl of cold stew. She dragged out the time waiting for her hateful job to start. Mama was rustling that hide out of the stream now, where it had been soaking for days and nights, gathering up its scummy, woolly slime. Mama had already set up the dreaded frame of branches, and there were strings of hide nearby that she would use to tie the skin up tight so that it could be worked. Omachius knew how important it was to tan the skin, how her mother would cut up the soft, smoked hide and sew on the winter's moccasins all summer. She pictured her mother finishing them with lovely, soft toe puckers so the girl's feet could twitch and dance. She could imagine Yellow Kettle beating them, lining them inside with the silkiest rabbit fur and pieces of an old wool blanket. Yes, it was an important task, but Omachius still didn't want it. She finished her stew, cleaned the bowl out with sand at the shore of the lake, and waited with a sigh for her mother to ask her to fetch the deer bone scraper. Her mother said something else, though. I need my scissors. Omachius sat up, suddenly full of energy. Omachius's mother was well known for owning a pair of scissors, and other women were always borrowing them. Omachius's first job ever since she could walk was to fetch her mother's scissors, kept safe from her small fingers in a beaded woolen case, and bring them home. She had never failed, for it was a job she liked, not only because she was sometimes given a handful of manomen, rice, or a little chunk of maple sugar by the borrowing lady, but because there were things to see there on the way and back. Right now, her sister Angeline was digging at the ground near spruce trees and cutting lengths of the roots, used to secure the house better and to finish baskets. She was cheerful, humming at her work, glad to have gotten the better of Omachius. She'd show Angeline, let her work till her hands fell off. Omachius had a fun job to do. Go fetch me the scissors from Old Tallow, said Omachius's mother. Without a moment's hesitation, before Mama changed her mind and remembered about the help she needed with the stinky hide, Omachius ran off.
Next time we'll read chapter two, Old Tallow. Thanks for joining me and I hope to see you again next week at Teen Story Share. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye.